Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're going to be discussing chapter three today, which is the tools of the laboratory. This is the second lecture for our Bio 235 course at Goodwin University. Uh, welcome everybody back. And again, great job in the discussion boards uh, this past week. Again, please feel free to reach out by email or during office hours for any questions that you have on any of the content that we are going to cover today. I look forward to being able to support your work in the course. So with that said, let's jump right into it. Chapter three, which is really going to give us an overview of a lot of the tools and techniques that we use in the laboratory setting to identify and study as well as classify microorganisms. And if you remember from our first lecture, we talked a lot about some of the scientific discoveries and breakthroughs uh, around identification and classification. And we talked about a, a field called taxonomy, which dealt with how we identify, how we group or classify microbes. We talked about all living organisms are uh, grouped into three different domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And then also how we name. And remember, we talked about naming as nomenclature. And that really is a, a system where we have a two-part or binomial name that is formatted with uh, appropriate capitalization for the genus name and is either italicized if we're typing or underlined if we're handwriting. So without further ado, we are going to focus the basis of Chapter 3's lecture today on what's known as the six eyes. And this is really a step-by-step -step process. These eyes go right in order of how we culture and identify uh, an unknown microbe. So we are assuming at this point that we don't know what microorganism that we're working with. So the six eyes go as follows. The first one is called inoculation. And this is where we take a little bit of that unknown sample and we streak it or inoculate it into a uh, container of media, whether that's a solid, semi-solid, or liquid media. And this is going to develop what we call a culture. And a culture is a uh, media that has microbial growth either in it or on it. We will talk today about colonies. Uh, one of the things that we hope to do when we have inoculation is to develop what's known as a pure culture, meaning that it consists of only one type of microorganism. But we'll also discuss what a mixed culture is as well. From there, we have isolation, which is if we have a mixed culture, being able to separate one bacterial species from another. We have incubation, and there are typically ovens that microbiologists use and they're able to control the temperature. Uh, most times you're going to see incubators either at 30 degrees or 37 degrees Celsius, uh, 37 degrees Celsius being right around body temperature of 98.6 Fahrenheit. Once we grow the microbes, then we're going to inspect them and we're going to be able to note their color, their size, their texture, and use that information to begin to do the process of identification. We're gathering that information, and there is a, a manual, which is almost like an old-school encyclopedia. It's a multi-volume series. It's called Berge's Manual of Systemic Microbiology or Bacteriology, and it's a uh, usually a four- to six-part series that includes all of the known bacterial species and their traits. So we're able to use kind of almost a dichotomous key and go through and answer a series of yes or no questions to really try to pick down and get at what the possible identification of that unknown microbe is. So again, this is a graphic from your textbook that really identifies the process of collecting a specimen. Again, when we collect specimens, we'll talk about this uh, a lot in a future chapter, when you are collecting a specimen, it's really important to maintain aseptic technique. Again, if you remember from chapter one, aseptic technique are strategies that prevent unwanted microbial contamination. So we wanna make sure truly what we are collecting is what we are gonna be working with. In 
and we're not introducing a microbe into our sample. When we talk about inoculation, remember that specifically when we talk about streaking onto an auger plate or in a liquid culture like you see here, we're talking about one of the living microbes, usually the bacteria. Remember that viruses, which are acellular, we can't grow in traditional laboratory media. So these microbes are often inoculated either into a tissue cell culture line or into a live egg uh, that contains the embryo to be able to study its uh, effects. Uh, remember that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites and they require a uh, host cell because they're inert and incapable of replication on their own. So where do we collect microbes from? Well, this is really applicable to all of you that are going into some type of clinical setting, whether it be respiratory or nursing. Traditionally, we're looking at body fluids, such as the blood um, and other places like that, respiratory secretions. We're talking about sputum samples, which are deep uh, tissue cultures from the lungs. If we're you know, suspecting a mycobacterium tuberculosis case, we can also get basically microbes from any common reservoir, water, soil, uh, plants, animals, even volcanoes. We talked about the archaea last time. We said that archaea are these extremophiles. They're closely related to bacteria with some subtle differences, such as the ability to grow in harsh environments, and they have a much more rigid, complex cell wall than bacteria do. From there, when we talk about the inoculation, which is the first of the six eyes, that sample is placed either into a media, and we mentioned that it could be a solid, semi-solid, or liquid. And in the case of the acellular viruses, it may be a live system, such as an egg. And we use tools uh, that are typically made of metal, and they are either called an inoculating loop, and you'll notice that near the street plate here, if you take a look at the bottom of this little wire mechanism, you'll notice that it forms a little loop at the bottom. We can also use a inoculating needle, which is almost identical to this inoculating loop, except at the bottom it is it comes to a point. It doesn't have this loop feature. We can use sterile applicator swabs or even a syringe. Uh, you'll notice here that this bottle has kind of a rubber uh, cap to it, and we're able to take that syringe and insert it through the rubber cap to uh, introduce the culture into this liquid sample. From there, we have to incubate it. We need to put it to the right heat conditions to allow the microbe to grow. And this can take anywhere from several hours to several days. Something like E. coli has a generation time, meaning the time it takes for the cells to divide, at about 37 minutes or so. So overnight, you could get a sample with several million cells versus something like mycobacterium, which causes tuberculosis, grows incredibly slow um, because of its waxy outer lipid appearance. It takes several days for mycobacterium to be able to grow to high numbers. So uh, depending on the type of microbe is going to determine how long it takes to grow. Human pathogens are going to prefer to grow at higher temperatures, around 37 degrees Celsius, which is similar to the 98.6 degree Fahrenheit body temperature uh, that they would be exposed to in the human body. Things that are archaeas, we call those thermophiles or hyperthermophiles, which grow at high heat conditions, are going to prefer temperatures closer to 42 or 45 degrees Celsius, much warmer than body temperature. From there, we're going to inspect. We're going to take our grown microbe. We're going to study its appearance um, on the surface of the Petri dish. You'll notice all these little dots. Those are what we call colonies. And those colonies are basically just masses of cells that are growing in close proximity. So we're going to do a macroscopic or visual appearance. We're going to note things like the size, the color, the texture of the colonies. 
but we're also going to utilize our best friend here, the microscope, and we're going to do some tests where we study the microscope or study the microbe underneath the microscope. So that's going to require us to make a preparation on a glass slide and apply some stains to it to be able to increase or enhance the contrast of our microbe to be able to view it under the microscope. And if you remember, when we're talking about bacteria, these are uh, require the compound light microscope to be able to see them. And when we're talking about the compound light microscope, we're usually talking about a magnification of about 1,000 times what we would see with the unaided eye. Um, viruses, which are ultra microscopic, are going to require the electron microscope, which is able to achieve much higher levels of magnification. We're talking anywhere from 10 to 100,000 times what the unaided eye would be able to detect. From there, now that we're starting to go through and inspect the microbes, we're going to gather some information. We are going to determine its size. We're going to be able to determine um, when it's stained, what type of cell wall that it has. Um, we're going to be able to determine the shape of the individual cells. Are they uh, spherical or what we would call cocci? Or are they cylindrical, which we call rod-shaped? And from there, we're going to do several other tests as well. We want to understand biochemical aspects of the microbe. How do they grow physiologically? Do they use oxygen? Do they prefer non-oxygen conditions, which we anaerobic or in the absence of oxygen? Do they prefer a type of nutrient source? You know, are they going to grow better with glucose or sucrose as a carbon source? We can do immunological tests. We can take a antibody to a particular um, microbial species and mix it and determine if we get a reaction telling us if those two are, or that particular microbe is similar to the antibody. So if you know anything about antibody testing relationships, your antibodies are specific to a particular antigen. And you can think of it almost as a puzzle piece. Two puzzle pieces have to have similar shapes to be able to fit together. They often call this the lock and key. So if I take a if I take my front door key and I try to go to anybody else's house on my street, my key is obviously not going to work. Well, the same concept happens with antibodies. Antibodies are produced for a particular antigen or unknown substance. And those two are going to fit together like a lock and key. So if you get that lock and key relationship, you're then able to tell what microbe you are studying. And then obviously studying the genetics. Genetic uh, typing, we use re, uh, relationships such as uh, DNA analysis or hybridization. Hybridization is really interesting because you can take uh, a known DNA strand and mix it with an unknown and see, uh, think about a zipper on a jacket. In a perfect relationship, if I was to take my zipper and pull it up, the zipper sides would come together and lock together perfectly. If there was not a match between the known DNA strand and the unknown DNA strand, then you're going to have areas where there's gaps because those two strands are unable to match up and come together. So we can use DNA as a specific means of telling what the relationship is between an unknown microbe and a known microbe. From there, again, I mentioned to you, there is a manual known as Ber uh, Berge's Manual of Systematic Bacteriology. It's a multi-part series that we can refer to uh, tests that have been performed for many different microbes. And that can help us to create an identification of the microbe, the unknown microbe that we're working with. Now, it's really important that in some cases, when we take that culture of bacteria and we grow it on a media surface, you'll notice here that we have some colonies that are orange and some that are green in appearance. And we call this a mixed culture. Mixed cultures are not the same as contamination. So that just means that we had multiple bacteria, two or more 
that were present in our original sample. Well, one of the things that we can do is we can streak that mixed culture across the surface of a Petri dish. And you'll notice inside this Petri dish, we have this gelatinous substance here, which is referred to as agar. So agar is a chemical compound. It's an extract from seaweed that we can actually add into a liquid media that will ca cause it to harden or solidify. We can then take that mixed culture and streak it across the surface of that bacterial media and grow the colonies up. And then what we can do is remember this little tool here. This is our inoculation loop. We can actually go in and pull off one of those individual colonies and grow it in a separate culture. So now we should theoretically have just that single microbe growing in that particular uh, culture. So from there, we want to get in and start talking about, now that we've introduced some of the general concepts of our six eyes, we want to get in and start talking about some of the individual tools that we use. And again, when we're talking about tools, one of the most important ones is the microscope. And there's two key traits that we want to understand when we look at different types of microscopes. We have what's known as magnification, which is, again, how large we can make an object appear. Light microscopes are going to have much lower total magnifications than electron microscopes, which can get to much higher magnifications. And we also have something known as resolving power or resolution. Resolution is the most important of the two characteristics because that is what's going to allow us to be able to distinguish finer details of the specimen that we're looking at. So the better the microscope, the better the resolving power. And when we define resolution, we're talking about the ability to be able to distinguish two adjacent objects as being separate from each other. So if I took and I drew two dots with a Sharpie on a piece of paper really close together, and I put them under the microscope, a microscope with a really poor resolution is going to look almost like it's one object. The better the microscope, meaning the better the resolution, now those two solid dots are going to be seen as two separate dots. Resolution is really important because that's what's going to allow us to see detail. Resolution is derived from two key features, the wavelength of light and the numerical aperture determine the level of resolution. So that's the wavelength and the numerical aperture. So let's start first with magnification. Again, magnification deals with the interaction between light waves coming from the light source on the microscope and the curvature of the lens. And that extent of enlargement, the amount of enlargement that you get is referred to as magnification. So we're gonna see that, <coughs> excuse me, you will get some magnification from the ocular lens, about 10 times magnification from the ocular. And then depending on which objective lens that you're using, that's gonna determine Again, how much additional magnification. And if we multiply those two together, the ocular and the objective, that's going to give us our total magnification for our particular spec. When we get into the lab portion, again, your first couple of weeks as you get your microscope in from eScience and it's assembled, you are then going to, as your one of your first assignments, Take a picture of your microscope and go through and label it. So you're getting used to the terminology for the parts. Some of the big ones that we have is obviously here's our ocular lenses, which give us that tenfold magnification. And then down here, right underneath on what's considered the neck of the microscope, we have this revolving nose piece. And on that nose piece, 
We have different uh, objective lenses, which are termed by different colors. You'll notice that they have this distinctive colored line on them. And we typically have a low power uh, in scanning and a high power uh, objective lenses as the primary one. So your 4X is what they term as your scanning. 10X is your low power. That's the yellow one over here. Your 40X is your high power. And then this one here is significant. This is the 100X. And this 100X lens, which we'll get into in a little bit, is known as the oil immersion lens. And then down over here on the base of the microscope is the light source. So when this turns on, you've got these photons of light that are emitted. And there is actually an additional lens that is located underneath the stage called the condenser. The condenser doesn't provide any additional magnification. What it's doing is think about it almost as a, a channel. It's taking all these photons of light and it's channeling it or bringing it up through the stage into the objective lens so we get the best quality image possible. So we have two different phases of magnification. We get obviously what comes through the objective lens, and that's what we know as the real image. The real image then goes up through the ocular lens, where it gets magnified again. We talked about that tenfold magnification, and that's what we term the virtual image. We've already mentioned total magnification. Again, when we describe the amount of enlargement for an image, we're really referring to this total magnification, and that's where we're taking whatever our objective lens power is, 10x, 4x, 40x, 100x, and we're multiplying it by 10, which is our ocular lens power. So if I had 4x as my objective, I would multiply that by 10. So 4 times 10 gives me a total magnification of 40. If I was under the 40x objective, my objective power would then be 40 times 10 would give me a total magnification of 400 times. We also mentioned resolution as the most important trait of the microscope. And we mentioned that resolution is defined as the ability to be able to see two adjacent objects as being separate. So again, it's important to understand that the better the microscope, the better the ability to be able to view objects that are really small and close together as truly being separate. It gives us that finer detail to our image. And again, it's the result of not only the wavelength of light that we're using, but also the numerical aperture. So here's how we really quantify or look at the numerics of resolution. So in order to get our resolving power, we're taking our wavelength of light, which is often in nanometers. So for instance, it may be 600 nanometers. And then we are taking that and dividing it by two times the numerical aperture. And you can actually look at a lens to get the quality of your numerical aperture. So most lenses on a light microscope range from somewhere between 0 0.1 to 1.25. The shorter the wavelength and the larger the numerical aperture will give us better resolution. So again, visible light wavelengths range anywhere from about 400 to 750 nanometers. So the shorter wavelength, the larger the numerical aperture, the more we get towards this 1.25 the better the resolution. So that 100x lens that we talked about earlier, the oil immersion lens, the resolution is about 0.2 micrometers. And magnification can be anywhere between about 40 times and about 2,000 times when we're talking about our light microscope. So how does the oil immersion lens work? So the whole purpose of using and applying oil to the base of the slide, right underneath the objective lens, is to prevent light from being deflected away. 
So anytime light is emitted from a source, it is going to contact things like dust particles in the air. And if you think about it, almost as like a uh, like a pinball machine. When you press the button and the ball gets ejected, it's going to hit and bounce off of all of the different surfaces inside the pinball machine. And that ball can then go in any direction that it's it's pushed. So anytime we're talking about just a typical lens that doesn't have the oil, you'll notice as the light comes up from the light source through the slide and into my objective lens, I lose some of those photons of light because they're deflected from particles in the air. So the quality of my image is going to decrease because a certain proportion of my light never goes up through the objective lens and eventually creates the virtual image that I see through the ocular. Well, when we apply this immersion oil for the 100x lens, that oil helps to prevent the deflection of light. So we get maximal amounts of light traveling up through the objective lens and into eventually creating the image that is detected by my eye. So the oil immersion helps to really channel the maximum amount of light up through the lens, creating a really clear, distinct image. Now, let's talk about some of the different types of microscopes that we are going to see throughout the course. The first one that we're going to talk about is the bright field microscope. So we're going to talk about bright field and dark field. And I want you to think about for a moment, when we talk about bright and bright field and dark field, there's two parts to the image that we're viewing with our eye. So we have the specimen. And if you look at the diagram here, you'll notice these cell, these circular cells. This is our specimen. And then this other area that's all around the specimen is what's known as our field of view. So this entire area inside of this square is representative of our field of view. One of the things that I want you to understand is if you take this word and you break it down, we have field. So think about field as the field of view. This is the area that surrounds our specimen. With a bright field microscope, the field of view is bright. You're going to notice that this entire area surrounding the cells is illuminated. The specimens are dark. Right? So the reason why is we're getting that contrast. We have this really bright field with these dark specimens, which allows us to be able to see a lot of that external detail of the specimen that we're viewing. So bright field, think bright field of view. This is perhaps the most widely used uh, microscopy that we know of because the specimen is darker than the surroundings. Again, we're illuminating this field as bright. And this is particularly useful if we're looking at live or preserved stained specimens. Bright field microscopes are the least useful in viewing unstained specimens. So it's really important that if you're using bright field and you're using a specimen that's preserved, that we've applied stains to increase that contrast. Dark field, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. Now, you'll notice that the field of view surrounding the cells is completely dark. Again, dark field, field of view is dark. Specimens are now illuminated. So now you get this particularly bright specimen against the dark background. So this is usually, unlike bright field, this is used with unstained or live specimens. We also have what's known as phase contrast. And what happens in phase contrast is our cells are produced along a bright background. And this is really helpful because we can now take any of those intracellular structures that are unstained and we can see differences based on differences in density. So differences in density is one of the key things. So we really are able to take advantage of any of those very subtle changes in the light waves that go through a specimen 
And it's going to allow us, based on varying densities, to be able to see intracellular structures within a cell. Fluorescence microscope uh, are utilized a lot in the lab setting. So when I was doing my graduate level work, um, I would often, I was studying the impacts of E. coli uh, in the intestine. And what we would actually do is we would infect mice, uh, lab mice, with uh, the E. coli, and we would study the implications of, their col of the E. coli colonization over several days in an experiment. And at the end, we would actually remove the intestine, and we would use a, uh, a, a machine to basically create these cross, very thin cross sections of the uh, intestine, and we would able to tag uh, utilizing a fluorescent tag, we were able to tag the E. coli bacterial cells and expose them to a source of UV light. And when they were exposed to that UV light, that little tag would actually glow. And we would be able to see the location of different E. coli strains within the intestine. So we're able to tell, were they closer to the wall? Did they stay within the mucus layer? Uh, within the intestine. So we could determine some things about infectivity and inside the body where these microbes had preference to grow. So it's really useful in being able to diagnose infections. Then we get into things like the confocal microscopes, which are particularly helpful with scanning the outer surface. So the confocal microscope actually uses a laser beam of light that scans the surface of the specimen, and it actually links or embeds all of these different images to create this, basically this depth or multiple planes to a specimen to be able to view uh, the, the key external details. So we just looked at a several different versions of the light microscope. We're gonna now transition to the electron microscope. And as we mentioned earlier, these are gonna give us much, much higher levels of magnification, usually from about 5,000 time, 5, times to about a million times compared to the light microscope, which we saw went between about 40 and 2,000. And instead of using a beam of light or photons to create our specimen, this is gonna use a beam of electrons. And those electrons travel in waves, and they give us not only high magnification, but also much more substantial resolving powers because of those wavelengths. And this particular table gives you kind of some of the characteristics compared between light microscopes and electron microscopes. So this is table 3.3 three in your textbook. We're gonna talk about the two different types of electron microscopes now. So we have the TEM or transmission electron microscope. And when we think of transmission, we think about going through something. So we're actually crossing through something. Um, with the transmission electron microscope, this is going to give us greater internal details. So the darker areas are gonna represent much denser parts whereas the lighter areas are more transparent or less dense. So it's gonna be able to allow us to see where there's a lot of mass within a particular specimen. The scanning electron microscope, on the other hand, when we think of scanning, like we saw with the confocal microscope, this is gonna give us outer surface detail. So we're gonna get, uh, basically the way this works is we are going to coat the outside of our specimen with a heavy metal. And the electrons are then going to be subjected to that outer surface, and they're going to interact with the heavy metal coating to create a image of the outer surface of that particular specimen. And typically these are black and white. The color that you see derived in the picture here actually comes from the interaction with the metal coating that is presenting that, uh, that outer surface detail color. Now, we also need to talk about different types of preparation. So we are going to prepare ourselves very differently based on what we're looking to see. 
if we are looking to see movement and motility, so motility is another word for movement when we're talking about microbes, the most important drop mount that we want to use is what's called the hanging drop mount. So hanging drop mounts are done on what are called depression slides. They have kind of a little divot in the middle of the slide where we would put the specimen on a cover slip, put the cover slip over the slide, and then the specimen is actually going to hang down in the liquid into that depression. And it's going to allow us to be able to see some of those movement characteristics that we're looking for. Fixed mounts, on the other hand, are only going to allow us to be able to see preserved specimens. So fixed mounts involve taking your inoculating loop or your inoculating lenal, removing a little bit of your specimen, and putting it or smearing it on the surface of the slide. Once the specimen is kind of smeared on the surface of the slide, we expose it to some heat. And once it's heated, it actually fixes the microbe to the slide. But the drawback is once we heat it, anytime you expose something living to high heat to a flame, it's going to kill the specimen. So we are now no longer going to be able to see movement. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to create a smear on the slide that allows us to be able to stain it to be able to increase that contrast and see visually different cell parts or different cells on the same slide. So those wet or hanging drop mounts are particularly useful for studying motility and arrangement. Fixed mounts, on the other hand, are preserved specimens and it's going to allow us to be able to stain and really study particular features of those cells. So when we talk about stains and the stains that we would use in those fixed mounts, we talk about basically a couple different types of dyes. We talk about basic dyes, which are cationic. And anytime you think about cations, that just means positively charged. A way to remember that. If you think about this T here in cationic, the T looks almost like a plus sign, which means positive. So cationic always involves a positive charge. So these positive charge dyes, these basic dyes, are then going to be attracted when we put them on the surface of a cell to any of the parts of the cell that contain a negative charge. Okay, so think about that. Opposites attract. So a positively charged basic dye is going to be attracted to negative components on the surface of the cell. Acidic dyes, on the other hand, these have very low pHs. These are going to be what we call anionic or negatively charged. Again, just like we saw here with cationic, this T looking like a plus sign. Anionic, think of this N right here as negative. So N for negative, anionic or acidic dyes have a negative charge to them. So most cases, we call this negative staining. This is an actual technique where instead of the dye being attracted to the surface of the cell, since the cell surfaces are typically negative, if we're dealing with a negatively charged dye, opposites uh, attract, similar ones repel. So a uh, anionic or a negatively changed, uh, negatively charged, excuse me, dye is going to be repelled by the negative surface of the cell. So instead of the cells being stained, you'll notice here that the background is stained. So negative staining stains the background and not the cell itself. So the cell remains colorless and the background is what obtains the dye. We also can talk about stains in terms of their functionality. So simple stains, which are, uh, as the word describes, the simplest of the different staining methods. Simple stain uses only one dye or reagent. So typically simple stains are things like um, crystal violet or methylene blue, which are gonna stain the cells either purple or blue in color. And really what a scientist would use a simple stain for is to study the shape, the 
which we call the morphology, the size, or how the cells are arranged. Are they in pairs? Are they in big clusters? Are they in chains? Differential stains, on the other hand, utilize uh, different levels of stain. So there's multiple stains that are used. So typically we use a primary stain to do the initial stain. And then at the end, we have a counter stain, which is going to help us to be able to distinguish or differentiate, as the word differential sounds like, two different cell types. So differential stains are going to allow us to be able to distinguish between two or more cell types on the same slide. We have some examples of differential stains, things like the Gram stain, which is going to allow us to see differences in cell wall structure. We have the acid fast stain, which is going to allow us to be able to distinguish organisms that have a cell wall that has a very high lipid characteristic. We talk about mycobacterium when we do acid fast staining. And then we also have the endospore stain. And if you remember from chapter one, we talked about these really tough dormant resistant structures that certain bacteria can produce under stress conditions. The endospore stain is going to allow us to see these endospores versus these vegetative or normally growing active cells. So simple stains, one diarrhea reagent, differential stains allow us to distinguish between two or more cell types on the same slide. We also have structural stains, and the structural stains are going to allow us to be able to see different cell parts. So we can look at things like capsules, which are these protective coatings that are formed on the outside of a cell. We can also stain for flagella, which are these whip-like tails that allow the bacteria to exhibit motility. So again, if we break these down, this is a figure from your textbook. We have our simple and negative stains, which use one dye to observe the cells. Remember, Simple stains allow us to see morphology or arrangement. The negative stain is using those anionic or negatively charged dyes. So they're repelled from the cell surface and they stain the background as opposed to staining the cell. We have several examples of differential stains, which allow us to distinguish between two or more cell types on the same slide. So we have the gram stain. You'll notice here that our gram positive cells stain purple. Our gram negative cells stain pink. We have our acid fast stain, which is going to allow us to stain cells that have a very high lipid content. So you'll notice that we have these pink cells here, which are our acid fast positive. And we have these blue cells that you see kind of in the background that are our non-acid fast cells. And then we also have our endospore stain. So you'll notice these rod-shaped, we call these vegetative cells. These are the normally active growing cells that will stain pink. Any of the endospores, which you can see as these little spherical objects, these are gonna stain green in color. And then we also have a class of stains known as the structural stains that are going to allow us to see particular structures, such as the capsule. You'll notice this kind of halo that forms around the cell. That's known as the capsule. These little whip-like projections that you see here, they look almost like little hairs coming from the surface of the cell. These are flagella or these movement structures. Now, if we go back earlier to our six eyes, our first eye we talked about was isolation. And how do we get cells separated from each other on the surface of a Petri dish or on media? So we talk a lot about a colony. And colonies are these mounds of cells that form on the surface of our culture media and that colony consists of only one species. So we have several techniques that we can utilize to actually obtain 
colonies on the surface of a petri dish. We have the streak plate technique, which uses our inoculating loop. And that inoculating loop, basically we create the zigzag pattern, which over time is gonna dilute my culture out, allowing me to go from a very dense application to where we have the presence of these little colonies. You'll see these yellow colonies and these red colonies on the surface of my dish. So it's extremely dense here. We have tons of colonies together all the way out here to where we dilute it to just these very fine individual colonies. We have the pour plate technique, and this is where the microbes are actually introduced into a liquid culture. That liquid culture is then poured onto the surface of the plate and is spread out. And those colonies are either on the surface of the auger, or some can actually be suspended within the auger. Um, because again, we've added the culture right into a liquid and then poured it out onto the surface of the plate and allowed it to solidify. Finally, we have the spread plate technique, which uses this little hockey stick and we drop the liquid down onto the column, onto the surface of the auger with a pipette. And we use the spreader to basically create this thin layer or film where the colonies are able to grow. So these are three techniques that are used to create those, uh, those colonies, those pure cultures where we're able to separate out the microbes on the plate. So when we inspect and we look at the cultures, we're looking for a couple different things. We wanna know, is it a pure culture or is it a mixed culture? So if there is only a single type of bacterial colony present, we know that we have a pure culture. And if you look here, the first picture on the left, you'll notice that we have uh, a mixture of colonies here. This is what's known as a mixed culture. And remember that we can easily go in with an inoculating loop or a needle, take a little bit of our colony off our plate here, and grow it separately to get our pure culture. But we also want to check for contaminants. So you'll notice on the middle picture here, we have all these beautiful red colonies, and then we get this cloud shaped, kind of hazy white growth in the middle of the plate. That unknown or unwanted growth is what we refer to as a contaminant. So mixed cultures don't necessarily mean that there's contamination, it means that we have multiple bacterial colonies growing on the same plate. We also talked about ways to identify microbes. We can look at the growth on the surface of the plate, how the, the colonies grow, what they look like on the plate. So we can describe these as kind of small or yellow in color. We can stain them under the microscope and talk about what they look like shape-wise, color-wise. We mentioned that we can look at their DNA sequence. We can do biochemical tests to determine things like what do they use for nutrient? Um, do they prefer oxygen or non-oxygen environments? And we can also look at how do they interact with different antibodies? When we get in and we start talking about media, there are a few different ways that we can classify the types of growth media that we use in the clinical setting. First of all, the purpose or function, which you see down here. We can also define it as the composition. Is it synthetic? Which we, means that we chemically define out what we have in the media. Or is it complex? And then we can also look at the physical state. Is it liquid? Is it semi-solid? Or is it solid? So we're going to dive into these three different uh, classification types now. When we talk about physical states of media, we're either talking about liquid, which we refer to as a broth, and it does not become solid. Semi-solid has traits of both. So it is a liquid with a slight amount of auger added to it 
to give it more of a gelatinous or jello like appearance. It does not become completely solid, still retains some of the liquid properties to it. Or we can have the solid one, which is primarily what we're going to work with in this course in the lab setting, where we add that auger in, and that auger actually causes the surface to become firm and it creates a very good background for us to grow our microbes on. So that's physical state, liquid, semi-solid, or solid. As we mentioned, auger is the most common uh, solidifying agent. It's an extract from red seaweed, and it liquefies or boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and it solidifies at 42 degrees Celsius. So we can Take this solid substance, we can heat it up and turn it into a liquid. We can then pour it and then allow it to cool down to that 42 degrees Celsius mark and solidify again. Make sure you're familiar with the 42 degrees. You will see that in the lab setting. That's something we definitely want to make sure that you understand. And microbes do not digest the auger itself. We can add certain nutrients into the auger but the microbes themselves are not going to metabolize the auger. So it's not like they're going to destroy the auger surface that they're growing on. The most commonly used media that we have are what we call the nutrient media. The nutrient media contain usually a bunch of different compounds, things like beef extract, peptone, and it's going to create a really good source of nutrients to grow several different types of microbes. So it's going to be a really abundant media. It's going to allow us to grow uh, as many uh, microbes as possible. Our second classification type is the chemical composition. And I mentioned a little while ago, we have synthetic and complex is kind of the two main uh, types of chemical compositions. Think of synthetic as a recipe that you would use when you bake. So when you're in the kitchen and you're baking, say, cookies, it is really important for you to have the exact ingredients measured out precisely. A synthetic media contains these organic and inorganic compounds to exact amounts. So we know that there's two grams of peptone or two grams of uh, serum that are added to that particular auger. So synthetic is chemically defined. We know the exact amounts, precise amounts in the media. The opposite of that is what we call complex media. And that just basically means if you think about when you're cooking, uh, cooking is a little different from baking. When we cook, we add a bunch of different ingredients. We may add, you know, just take a, a pinch of salt and add it in or a couple of cranks of black pepper. We really get it to taste and there's not necessarily a precise amount of the ingredients that we add in. So complex media have, you know, at least one ingredient where it's we don't really define out how much is added to it. We also have general purpose media which allows us, like we saw with nutrient media, to grow a broad range of microbes. And then there's often cases where we experience microbes that we refer to as fastidious. Fastidious means that they require special growth factors to allow them to grow. So enriched media often contains these really complex substances such as blood or serum or hemoglobin to grow these fastidious or these very particular microbes. So here are some examples for you when we talk about the chemical content of media. Uh, so this particular one, this is grown on a blood auger plate. This is a culture of uh, a microbe called Streptococcus pyogenes. It often causes things like pharyngitis or strep throat. Um, here's another one here. This is referred to as chocolate auger. So it's infused with, uh, you know, hemoglobin. 
and that's added to the media to help promote the growth of these fastidious microbes. We can also group growth media as either being selective or differential. Selective or differential means that in the case of selective, we are adding a particular chemical compound to the media. And when we add that chemical compound, it's going to inhibit the growth of everything else except for the one microbe that we are looking to grow. So we're adding this chemical in, and that is only going to permit a single microbe to grow up. We're selecting for an individual microbe. Differential media, on the other hand, if you think back to differential staining, Remember, differential staining allowed us to distinguish between two different cell types. Well, differential media is going to allow us to do the same thing. It's going to allow us to grow different types of microbes on the same auger plate. Okay, so we're going to be able to distinguish between two different microbes. It's usually going to cause those microbes to have a different color to them. Auger can be both selective and differential. So we can add compounds in that are going to select for individual microbes, but allow us, you'll notice this one here has kind of a white gray appearance to it, where this one here, this microbe has a pink appearance to it. So it's allowing us to see this differential. So it's acting as not only a differential media, but again, we're also limiting what's growing on the plate. So we're selecting for different microbes. Again, you're just able to see, uh, again, some of the, the characteristics of differential media. We're able to get that difference in color based on what the microbe is. And one example of a, a kind of miscellaneous media that will allow us to distinguish some very important characteristics about biochemical growth is called carbohydrate fermentation medium. So the reason why this is referred to as a carbohydrate media is that we have added sugars into the media. So this is a liquid broth media. And in this media, we've added a sugar, say for instance, glucose or sucrose. And then we've injected our bacteria into the liquid media. And as that bacteria grows, if it's able to ferment that sugar, it's going to create an acid and also a gas. So you'll notice inside this tube, we have this other smaller test tube that's kind of inverted. It's upside down. As the micro grows, if it's able to ferment or convert that uh, sugar into an acid, the color of the tube is going to change. So you're going to get this yellow appearance but it may also produce a gas. And that little tube is gonna capture this gas bubble here. So it's gonna tell us not only does it use a particular sugar, but also does it produce gas? And this little tube that you see, this is actually called a Durham tube, D-U-R-H-A-M. This Durham tube is designed solely to trap any gas bubbles that are produced during the growth of the microbe. So that is the wrap. That's a wrap for our chapter three lecture. Again, really getting into and unpacking some of the specifics about uh, the growth of microbes in different types of media, but also ways and tools that we can study microbes in the lab setting. So feel free as you look over your lecture slides, as you watch this presentation, if you have questions, bring them to office hours and uh, let me know. Feel free to post the questions and the instructor, and I look forward to talking to everybody soon. Take care.